Hi guys, and welcome to this virtual lecture course on quantum condensed matter physics. I'm Dr. Andrew Mitchell, and in this lecture we'll be discussing phase transitions and spontaneous symmetry breaking across a phase transition. It's an experimental fact that in many systems, as you cool the system down, it goes through a phase transition. In the high temperature phase, this is often a high symmetry situation, a disordered situation, whereas when you go to the low temperature phase, you pass through the phase transition, and you um, then have a situation with a lower symmetry. This is an ordered state. As a good example, consider a liquid which has um, um, all the particles moving around in different directions. This is a high symmetry situation. Um, there's a translational symmetry in space, there's a rotational symmetry in space and so on. But as you cool the system down, it solidifies, it freezes, it becomes a crystalline solid. Um, the crystalline solid, of course, has a lower symmetry because now uh, we have the discrete lattice symmetry. We can translate our unit cell by lattice vectors, but we lose the continuous uh, rotational symmetry and translational symmetry in free space. Another example would be as we um, cool a ferromagnetic system down um, through the Curie temperature, the system develops spontaneously a certain magnetization. This is obviously a lower symmetry situation than the unmagnetized state because the system has picked out a specific polarization vector. This is again uh, a lower symmetry than the, uh, the underlying symmetry of free space, which is isotropic and homogeneous. So how does this happen? In particular, all of these systems are described by Hamiltonians, and both phases are actually described by the same Hamiltonian. It would seem that the symmetries should be encoded on the level of the Hamiltonian, so if the same Hamiltonian describes both phases, how can we get different symmetries? We'll see that a way of characterizing um, these phase transitions is through um, the macroscopic uh, observable quantities. These are the things you can really measure in experiments. And of course, we use the usual machinery of statistical mechanics to calculate those things. We'll see that across a phase transition, the ergodic principle that underpins the derivation of uh, our equations uh, to work out these observables is actually breaking down, and we'll see why that is and what the consequences are. This actually allows us to get the phenomenon of spontaneous symmetry breaking. So we'll see um, this in a specific example in the second part of the lecture. We'll talk about the onset of ferromagnetism, um, we'll look at a specific example of the Heisenberg model, and we'll see that this system has a phase transition as we lower the temperature to a polarized state, which is of lower symmetry. We see this spontaneous symmetry breaking occur in the system. Um, this is a very complicated model, and um, to solve it exactly um, is basically impossible, but we will use um, a, a very powerful and useful technique. It gives us a very intuitive feel um, for the underlying physics. This is called mean field theory. It's certainly an approximation, but it's a very good technique to learn. So in this lecture, we're going to study some general concepts and also look at this specific example of um, the phase transition in ferromagnets using mean field theory. We'll see that the magnetization in that system is basically plays the role of an order parameter, meaning that it's zero in the disordered high temperature phase. That's the situation with the high symmetry. And as we lower the temperature through a critical temperature, that's called the Curie temperature in this case, this magnetization spontaneously becomes finite and um, this is describing then the low temperature ordered and low symmetry phase. So we're going to look at these two complementary things in this lecture, the general framework and the general concepts, as well as this specific example and this technique called mean field theory. So let's get down to work. So in this lecture, we'll be discussing broken symmetry and phase transitions. We'll actually start by exploring the experimental fact that the symmetry of a system often changes across a phase transition. For example, consider the classical transition from liquid water to solid ice. Liquid water has a high symmetry. It's the symmetry of continuous spatial translations and rotations. However, when we cool down the liquid, we undergo a phase transition to solid ice. There we have a discrete symmetry of the crystal lattice in the solid. We no longer have the continuous translations and rotations in space. Of course, the crystal is periodic. We can take a unit cell of the crystal and translate it by one lattice vector. However, this is a discrete symmetry 
rather than a continuous symmetry. Another example is that of magnetism. Magnetism develops in materials when we cool below a certain critical temperature. When metals become ferromagnets, we cool below the Curie temperature. When antiferromagnetic order develops, we call that the Nial temperature. This is a kind of freezing, but not like from the liquid phase to the solid phase. Rather, we talk about a spin freezing, a magnetic ordering. Structurally, the system remains a solid in both cases, but order can develop in the spin configurations. This is another example where the symmetry is being lowered as we cool the temperature. The unmagnetized state is a rather high symmetry situation. The magnetic moments in the solid are pointing in all different directions. There is no preferred direction. However, as we lower the temperature, the system becomes magnetized. This is accompanied by the lowering of the symmetry. A single direction for the magnetization is picked out. This might seem strange, given that all directions are equivalent. There is no privileged direction. However, nature seems to pick out a specific direction for the magnetization. Why is this? We also have more subtle examples. What about when we cool the material down through the superconducting transition? What is the order that's developing in this case? In what sense is a superconductor a more ordered state than a regular metal? So we seem to have this phenomenology that there is symmetry breaking at a phase transition. But how and why? Before I discuss the mechanism for spontaneous symmetry breaking in real systems, I want to play devil's advocate and try to convince you that actually this should never happen. I want to convince you here that there really is a puzzle before resolving that puzzle. A physical system is described by some microscopic Hamiltonian. Let's call it H hat. Solving this model basically means solving the Schrodinger equation. We want to find the wave functions and the energies which satisfy the Schrodinger equation H psi is equal to E psi. With this information at hand, we can now understand the thermodynamic properties of this system. These follow using the machinery of statistical mechanics. Signatures of phase transitions occur in thermodynamic observable quantities. These signatures, for example, could be uh, discontinuities in certain observables as we change the temperature, or it could be a derivative discontinuity. We can also get phase transitions as we vary some parameter other than temperature. Thermal phase transitions, which we get on varying the temperature, are driven by thermal fluctuations, whereas quantum phase transitions can happen right down to t equals zero. A quantum phase transition might arise at t equals zero by varying, for example, the pressure of a system. Quantum phase transitions are therefore driven by quantum fluctuations. Notice that both types of transitions can happen in quantum mechanical systems. It's just they're driven by different kinds of fluctuations. But notice that phase transitions occur really in bulk systems. These are systems in the thermodynamic limit of a large number of particles. We can't really talk about phase transitions in a system of just a few particles. And that's because the framework we use to understand these phase transitions are the thermodynamic properties that require a statistical mechanical treatment. And this is something that is working in the thermodynamic limit. In a closed quantum system of a few particles, we can, of course, talk about a change in ground state, and we can also talk about how expectation values change. But this is a little bit different from talking about bulk thermodynamic properties. And it's these thermodynamic properties that I want to talk about in this lecture. So the puzzle is that it is the same Hamiltonian that describes both phases across a phase transition. It's just that we end up with a different thermodynamic phase depending on the temperature or some model parameter. Why is this important? Well, the Hamiltonian, of course, controls the symmetries of the system. They're encoded on the level of the Hamiltonian. So if the same Hamiltonian describes different phases, we would expect the different phases to have the same symmetries. But as I argued on the previous slide, the symmetry of a system often changes across a phase transition. So let's unpack this in a little more detail. Symmetries are of course related to conserved quantities. Remember here Notice theorem, which makes this connection precise. For example, the continuous translational symmetry in space is related to conserved momentum. And the continuous SU2 rotational spin symmetry is related to the conserved spin angular momentum. These symmetries and these conserved quantities are encoded on the level of the Hamiltonian. For example, let's consider that a Hamiltonian H hat 
is parameterized by some continuous variable theta. A symmetry means that if we add some constants to theta, for example, theta plus phi, then we obtain the same Hamiltonian, the same properties. A simple example would be a system with a rotational symmetry. There, we can imagine theta as being the angle of rotation. If the system is symmetric under rotations, then we can rotate our angle to theta plus phi, and the system will remain unchanged. This would be equivalent to rotating our coordinate system. Likewise, conserved quantities are encoded on the level of the Hamiltonian. If we consider the eigenvalues of some operator, here, omega hat, these things will be conserved quantities, meaning they don't change in time, if the corresponding operator, omega hat, commutes with the Hamiltonian. I proved this in a previous lecture by showing that if an operator commutes with the Hamiltonian, then its corresponding eigenvalues are good quantum numbers. They are conserved by the Hamiltonian and they don't change in time. We can form a simultaneous eigenbasis of the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian and the eigenstates of the operator omega hat. We can label our states according to omega. So either way, we see that the Hamiltonian contains information about the symmetries and it contains information about conserved quantities, these two of course being related by notice theorem. This is puzzling because the symmetries and the conserved quantities appear to change when we cross a phase transition. And yet both phases are described by the same Hamiltonian. So how can the symmetry of the underlying Hamiltonian be broken by the ground state in a particular phase? Note here that the symmetry is usually lower than that of the Hamiltonian in the low temperature phases. As a simple example, remember the case of freezing. We have a liquid with a high symmetry, but as we cool it down, we go to a low temperature state, the solid, in which we have a crystalline structure. And that structure, of course, has a lower symmetry than the uh, translational and rotational symmetry of free space. If states of matter really did respect the underlying symmetry of the Hamiltonian, we would never have such crystalline solids. We would never have ordered magnetic states or superconductors. It is an experimental fact that many known stable phases of matter, in fact, most known stable phases of matter, have lower symmetries than the underlying physical laws would seem to dictate. This is the result of so-called spontaneous symmetry breaking, which can occur across a phase transition. This symmetry breaking is observable in bulk thermodynamical expectation values. For example, if we have some operator corresponding to an observable O hat, I can calculate the expectation value of this operator in the grand canonical ensemble. The way we conceptualize and calculate these thermodynamical expectation values is of course using the machinery of statistical mechanics. These observables pick up the spontaneous symmetry breaking. For example, consider a magnetically ordered state. We could calculate the bulk magnetization of the system, which is the expectation value of the SZ operator. If the state is magnetized, then we'd see a finite expectation value for the SZ operator. However, if the underlying Hamiltonian has SU2 spin symmetry, then we would expect that states with different SZ are all degenerate. The Boltzmann weights associated with those states would therefore be equal. And since states with a given spin S uh, have SZ values that come in pairs, plus SZ and minus SZ, we'd expect all of these contributions to cancel out. And overall, the expectation value of the SZ hat operator should be equal to zero. This is the usual argument because we would have a spin symmetry in the system, and therefore we'd expect there to be no net magnetization. If the system does develop a spontaneous magnetization as we cross a phase transition, then it means that spontaneous symmetry breaking has occurred. So let's have a look at the mechanism for spontaneous symmetry breaking from the perspective of statistical mechanics. In particular, we'll see that the usual arguments underpinning statistical mechanics can actually break down across a phase transition. To understand this, let's have another look at the statistical mechanical expression for the thermal expectation value of some operator. The thermal expectation value of O hat is 1 over Z times the sum over eigenstates J times the matrix elements of the operator evaluated in the eigenbasis, meaning we sandwich the operator O hat between uh, the ket psi J and the bra psi J, and then we multiply it by the corresponding Boltzmann weight e to the minus beta ej 
Beta here is the usual inverse temperature, 1 over kBt, and Ej is the corresponding energy of the eigenstate Ψj. Since the eigenstates Ψj and the energies Ej are determined by the Hamiltonian, it would seem that the expectation values are determined solely by the Hamiltonian, and in particular inherit the symmetry properties of the Hamiltonian. To see this, let's consider our familiar example of magnetization. Imagine that we have a Hamiltonian that has SU2 spin symmetry. What this means is that if we look at the Schrodinger equation that I've written down here, h hat acting on some state which I've labelled by s and sz, then that state will be an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian, we'll get the state back again, um, s and sz, times the eigenvalue, which is the energy of that state, es, and here the energy of that state does not depend on the sz value, only on the spin. So this equation holds for all sz. The energy is independent of the sz value. Spin states are 2s plus 1 degenerate, because all of the different values of sz, which range from minus s to plus s in integer steps, have the same energy. This property is, of course, a direct consequence of the SU2 spin symmetry. We can also write down an eigenvector equation for the sz operator. When sz hat acts on the state s sz, we of course get the state back again, multiplied by the eigenvalue sz this time. And the reason for that is, of course, with SU2 spin symmetry, um, we can form a simultaneous eigenbasis of the Hamiltonian and the sz operator. Therefore, sz is a good quantum number. We can label our states by sz. And of course, you've seen that I've already been doing that by writing down these kets with the quantum numbers s and sz. And as I mentioned, sz can take uh, values from minus s up to plus s in unit steps. There are two s plus one values. So if we have a look at the expression now for the expectation value of the sz hat operator, we can write this now in terms of eigenstates uh, labeled by the quantum numbers s and sz, where now I'm summing over s and sz rather than summing over the arbitrary eigenstates psi j on the left-hand side. And now I can write this as the sum over the spin s and the sum over sz, but here I'm going to restrict the sz values to just the positive sz. And I can do this by just saying that for every sz we have a corresponding minus sz, and that takes care of this condition. Then we have two matrix elements in the sum uh, for each sz, one at, uh, with the plus sz, one with the minus sz. But here's the important thing. Both of these states, because of this symmetry, the spin SU2 symmetry, both of these states have the same energy, Es. They have the same Boltzmann factor. Of course, these matrix elements will re return opposite values of sz. This one will return a value of plus sz, this one of minus sz. So each pair will cancel, and because they have the same Boltzmann weights, every term in the sum will cancel, and the whole thing will be equal to zero. So by this very simple example, we've seen that because of symmetries in the Hamiltonian, we see the same symmetries occurring in these expectation values. In this particular case, the spin symmetry tells us that the expectation value for the magnetization should be equal to zero. One can argue this purely on the grounds of symmetry without knowing any further information about the eigenstates or the eigenvalues. We don't have to solve the Schrodinger equation, we simply have to know something about the symmetries of the Hamiltonian to make these kind of arguments. Now, if we have spontaneous symmetry breaking, then apparently we should see a different symmetry showing up in these observables than appears in the actual Hamiltonian. How can that happen? it must mean that there is something wrong with the logic that we've applied here to get these results. In fact, as we'll see, across a phase transition, there is a breakdown in the assumptions that led to this formula. So what's wrong with that logic, and what does it imply? So here is the usual expression for the thermal expectation value of an operator given from statistical mechanics. I've written it out again here. Importantly, notice that here we have a sum over j of the eigenstates psi j, this must be a sum over the complete set of states. This is a sum over all of the possible states of the system. This actually follows from the ergodic principle. This states that all states of the system are accessible and are eventually explored in the dynamical evolution of the system. And in deriving this expression for the thermal expectation value, we use the fact that the behaviour averaged over time 
is the same as the behaviour averaged over states in phase space at a given instant in time. This is known as the ensemble average. It's this statistical treatment that gives rise to these results in statistical mechanics. The emergence of spontaneous symmetry breaking, and therefore the breakdown of this formula, actually can be traced back to the breakdown of this ergodic principle for these kinds of systems. In particular, states have the same energy according to the Hamiltonian, might be effectively decoupled by a large energy barrier separating them. What I mean here is that to interconvert between the two states, and hence sample them in our thermodynamic ensemble, we would require to quantum mechanically tunnel through a large barrier. The wider and the higher the potential energy barrier separating two states, the longer it takes to quantum mechanically tunnel between them. This is especially pronounced at low temperatures, when the system doesn't have enough energy to tunnel through a barrier. The time scale for the tunneling is therefore very long. The decoupling between states is therefore a kinetic effect rather than a thermodynamic one. The phase space therefore becomes fragmented. The system gets stuck in a certain region of phase space and it takes a very very long time to get to a different region of the phase space. The averages over a finite amount of time are therefore not necessarily equal to the averages over all states in phase space at an instant in time. Of course, in the limit of an infinite amount of time, these averages should be the same. But in a finite amount of time, relevant to our experimental observation of a system, these averages might not be the same. In this case, we should compute our thermal expectation values using only a part of the phase space. And this is the basic origin of spontaneous symmetry breaking. For example, consider two crystals with different spatial reference points. These might have formally the same energy due to the underlying isotropy and translational symmetry of free space. But they are effectively decoupled due to the large energy barrier required to melt and recrystallize the solid into a state with all the atoms shifted or reorientated in space. Consider, for example, two ferromagnets with a magnetization pointing in different directions. Again, these formally have the same energy. However, it takes a huge amount of energy to heat the system up through the Curie temperature to uh, melt the magnetic ordering so that now the spins are all pointing in different directions and then cool it down again so that the spin dynamics freeze and all of the spins are pointing in a different direction thereby having changed the magnetization vector. Alternatively, in both examples, we can consider the system quantum mechanically tunneling from one state to the other. Instead of heating a system up to overcome an energy barrier, we consider a low temperature situation but where the system quantum mechanically tunnels through the barrier. But the time scale for this quantum mechanical tunneling is very, very long if the barrier is high, and certainly changing the magnetization vector in a ferromagnet would have a very large energy barrier. In fact, the time scale for such quantum mechanical tunneling would be long compared to the age of the universe, so we can basically just ignore it. In cases where degenerate states are separated by a large energy barrier, we should actually not include all of them when computing statistical averages. This is because their contributions to the ensemble are effectively not well sampled. And indeed, these different states might correspond to macroscopically totally different configurations. This means that ergodicity breaks down, and phase space effectively separates into distinct, disconnected regions. So let's take a look now at the energetics of a phase transition. Let me plot the free energy, F, versus the expectation value, O, of some macroscopic quantity. This is some thermodynamic observable that we could measure in an experiment. The thermodynamic stability of a given phase is determined by the free energy. And let's say that we're in a condition where the free energy has an overall global minimum. Thermal equilibrium is defined as minimizing the free energy and so our system will occupy the bottom of this uh, free energy well here. Let's say this is the situation above the critical point. By that I mean the high temperature phase, T greater than some critical temperature, Tc. This is the high symmetry situation, and as we can see, the system at equilibrium occupies the bottom of this free energy well, and that corresponds to the observable O being equal to zero. Let's now consider the situation as we reduce the temperature below the critical temperature Tc. The profile of the free energy will change, and here I've illustrated the situation where there are two local minima in the free energy surface. 
it is energetically equivalent for the system to be in this configuration or in this configuration. Both of the states have the same free energy. Again, we find the equilibrium condition by minimizing the free energy, but here we have multiple choices. The ground state is degenerate. It can either be in this well or in this well. Of course, in some sense, the quantum mechanical solution to this is that the true state of the system is in a quantum superposition of both of these ground states. However, what happens in reality is that there might be a tiny, tiny perturbation, some random fluctuation or some outside perturbation, which causes one of the two states to be lower than the other, and then the system just gets stuck in that state. Because the system is not exploring all of phase space, it's basically getting trapped in the vicinity of this well, we have a low symmetry situation. And this also gives rise, as you can see from this figure, to a finite expectation value of this macroscopic observable. This is the symmetry breaking. And you can see here that it happens spontaneously. At the critical point, T equals TC, the thermodynamical state of the system develops a non-zero expectation value of some macroscopic quantity, here labelled O, which has a lower symmetry than the original Hamiltonian. This quantity is called the order parameter and signals the spontaneous symmetry breaking at a phase transition. An order parameter, O, is a macroscopic thermodynamical observable that one can measure in an experiment, and it takes the value of zero in the disordered high temperature or high symmetry phase, but becomes finite in the ordered or low temperature, low symmetry phase. A typical kind of graph of the order parameter versus temperature is plotted here. We see that at high temperatures, the value of the order parameter is equal to zero, and this is the disordered phase. Then at T equals TC, um, the order parameter takes on a finite value and then um, continues to be finite within this ordered phase at low temperature. The disordered phase is a high symmetry situation. Then we have symmetry breaking upon lowering temperature to the ordered phase. Symmetry breaking across phase transitions like this is rather ubiquitous, and it's one of the reasons why we need to study condensed matter systems on their own terms. We can't simply study the microscopic laws of nature and understand much about the emergent physics coming out in condensed matter systems. So far, the discussion has been very much on a conceptual level and rather abstract. In the second part of the lecture today, I want to talk about the phase transition in ferromagnets as a very specific and concrete example. This is in general a hard problem. However, we're going to use a simple approximation to get an intuitive understanding of the problem, and we'll actually see here the symmetry breaking and the phase transition. This is obtained using so-called mean field theory. This is an interesting technique in and of itself, and therefore it's good for us to discuss it at this point in the lecture course. I should emphasize right away that this is not an exact solution of the problem, but it is one that will give us a good understanding of the basic physics. Our model for the ferromagnetic material will support a disordered state with zero average magnetization and a high symmetry. This will be the high temperature phase stable for T greater than some critical Curie temperature Tc. Then, as we cool the system down, we'll pass through a phase transition to an ordered ferromagnetic state with a finite magnetization pointing in a particular direction and broken symmetry. This will be the low temperature phase and it will be stable for a temperature T less than the critical temperature, which is the Curie temperature, in this case, Tc. This will be an example of the spontaneous symmetry breaking that we've been discussing on the previous slides. So in this system, we have a phase transition at T equals Tc, and the magnetization, defined as the expectation value of the total Sz operator, is the order parameter. We will model the ferromagnet using the Heisenberg model, which I've written down in its most general form here for the pairwise exchange coupling interaction between spins located on sites i and j. This double sum over ij here and the coupling constants j ij tell us about the dimensionality and geometry of the lattice. As I've written here, it is totally general. We shall want to look at the ferromagnetic situation in which these coupling constants j ij here are less than zero. This condition will favour low energy states where all the spins are aligned. The JIJs define the dimensionality, geometry and connectivity of the lattice, but because it's an exchange interaction, it's typically short ranged. So let's consider the limit where the JIJs connect spins only on neighbouring sites of the lattice. 
let's say in particular that the parameter jij takes the constant fixed value j if i and j are neighbors and it's zero otherwise. As discussed in the previous lectures, the solution to this Heisenberg model is extremely complex. It's a genuine quantum many-body problem with strong correlations. In fact, except in a few special cases, there is no exact analytic solution to this model. Therefore, we're going to resort to a simple approximation, the so-called mean field theory. Here, however, it captures the essence of the ferromagnetic spin-freezing phase transition that we're interested in. It's a simple calculation, so let's work through it step by step. The basic mean field approximation is to assume that quantum fluctuations around the average value of operators is small. In fact, this is known to be a particularly good approximation when the coordination number of the lattice is rather large. This is because the quantum fluctuations arising due to the pairwise interactions uh, of the exchange couplings between a spin and its neighbors essentially cancel out the larger and larger the number of neighbors. In some sense, neglecting quantum fluctuations is equivalent to a semi-classical approximation, but we'll get onto that. First of all, we'll introduce an operator corresponding to the deviation in the spin away from its expectation value. So we'll define delta si vector hat to be the operator uh, si vector hat minus its expectation value. Remember, of course, that this expectation value is simply a number, it's a constant. The things with hats here, the delta si vector hat and si itself vector hat are operators. Let's now substitute this expression into our Hamiltonian, which I've written out again here. I can write that exactly as a mean field Hamiltonian denoted HMF plus this correction term. This correction term will involve uh, the deviation in the spins away from their expectation values squared, meaning delta SI vector hat dot uh, delta SJ vector hat. If we assume that the deviation in operators away from their expectation values is small, then this quadratic piece will be very small. The mean field approximation is simply to neglect this term. We throw away this second term in mean field theory. The mean field Hamiltonian is precisely this one. I get this simply by inserting the expression for SI vector hat into our Hamiltonian. Then I will obtain terms which are linear in the operators uh, SI vector hat and SJ vector hat, terms which uh, simply involve the constants, and terms which are quadratic in these deviations. The term that's quadratic in the deviation, as I've mentioned, is this residual piece here that we're neglecting in mean field theory, and that's going to leave us uh, with this term HMF, which I've written out. So the idea under mean field theory is that we approximate our full Hamiltonian to the mean field Hamiltonian. That's equivalent to neglecting this quadratic piece in the deviations, which itself would be a good approximation if we assume that the quantum fluctuations around the average values of the operators is indeed small. This approximation constitutes a massive simplification in terms of the complexity of the model and its physics. Why is that? Well, previously we had a Hamiltonian that was quadratic in these operators. We have an interaction between spins on sites i and j. In the new Hamiltonian, we don't see any quadratic terms in these operators. Remember, these expectation values are simply numbers. We see something that is now linear in the quantum mechanical operators. The spin here on a particular site J just depends on the expectation value of the spins on the neighboring sites I. Spin J is therefore seeing only the averaged field due to the spins of the neighboring sites, hence the mean field approximation. So to make progress now with our mean field Hamiltonian, we need to identify the value of these expectation values. According to symmetry, we would expect the expectation value of the spin on a given site i to be equal to zero. That is because our original Hamiltonian has this SU2 spin symmetry. And as we argued earlier, that implies that the average Z projection of the spin on a given site should vanish. That's of course because all directions are equivalent by symmetry. No direction is preserved, therefore we'd not expect there to be a finite magnetization along a particular direction, according to the symmetry of the bare Hamiltonian. But we know this is not the right answer. We know that in the low temperature limit, we have a ferromagnetically ordered state 
with the spins all aligned. The ferromagnetically ordered state is the one that's found in nature. Therefore, we have to allow for the possibility of broken symmetry. How do we do that? We need to allow for the possibility of a broken symmetry solution. We do this by saying that the magnitude of the expectation value of the SI vector hat operator can be greater than or equal to zero. Of course, symmetry arguments would tell us that it's equal to zero, but here we're allowing for the possibility that it could also take a finite positive value. Let's suppose now that the expectation value of our SI vector hat operator is something that takes a finite value, but it's spatially independent. It won't now depend on the site index i. Furthermore, without loss of generality, we'll assume that this polarization is along the z-axis. We assume that there is some polarization and it takes some particular direction, but then we just label that direction as the z-direction. That's equivalent to just rotating our coordinate axes so that the z-direction lies parallel to the direction of polarization. So we basically assumed two things so far. One is that the magnetization can assume a finite value, and the second is that it will be spatially independent. The motivation for this comes from the fact that we know what the ferromagnetically ordered ground state looks like. It is something with all of the spins aligned parallel and in some particular direction. If we were going to model the anti-ferromagnetic state, we would not want this object to be spatially independent, but rather something which was staggered. We'd want to reproduce some kind of up, down, up, down, up, down kind of solution. But in this present example, we're talking about ferromagnetism, and we know that the ferromagnetic ground state, the polarized one, is one where all of the sites are uh, equivalent and they're all pointing in a, some particular direction. We're just calling that direction the Z direction. So the logic here is that we assume from the outset that we can obtain such broken symmetry solutions. We're also using some physical insight about the knowledge of the eventual solutions to constrain the form of these expectation values. Finally, just notice that in this expression, this z vector here is just the unit vector pointing along the z direction. It's not an operator, it's just telling you in which direction the polarization lies. For each site i, we will define a net magnetic moment, mi, felt by the spin on site i. This is defined as the sum over the nearest neighbors j of jij times the expectation value of the sz operator for those neighboring spins in the z direction. But the expectation value of the neighboring spins are all the same independently of the site index j. That's coming from this ansatz here, that the polarization is spatially independent. Then I obtain the simplified expression where n is the number of nearest neighbors and we have a constant coupling j between nearest neighbors. That's basically coming from this nearest neighbor condition that we discussed a few slides ago. It's important to notice here that the net magnetic moment mi vector is not an operator. It doesn't have a hat. That is because it's simply a bunch of constants. It does have a direction. It's along the z direction but also it is spatially independent. You can see from this expression on the right hand side here that it does not depend on the site index i. So therefore, from now on, I'll describe the net magnetic moment on a given site as being simply m vector, and this is the same for all sites. I can now recast the whole mean field Hamiltonian in this simple form. There is a term that is linear in our si vector hat operators, and the coefficient of that is simply this net magnetic moment m vector. That was the reason for identifying this object. Then we have a constant term, which is actually also related to um, the net magnetic moment m, actually here the magnitude of that. And capital N here is simply the number of sites in the entire system. This is just following from this definition and inserting this definition into our mean field Hamiltonian. I will leave it for you as an exercise just to confirm this structure. We can also express this first term, m vector dot si vector hat, as m siz hat. This is because m vector is pointing along the z direction by construction, and so the dot product here is picking out the z projection of the spin, which is precisely siz hat. The magnitude is simply the magnitude of m vector which we already defined here as being simply m. What I now want to convince you of is the fact that this is a very simple Hamiltonian and we can solve it exactly.
Let's consider now explicitly s equals a half spins. Actually, up until this point, we could have had spins of any s, but now we'll focus on the s equals a half solution. This means that on a given site i, we can look at the spin projection onto the z-axis, sIz, and this will be either plus or minus a half only. In fact, we can see that the sIz hat operator actually commutes with the mean field Hamiltonian in this form. This is the case for the sz operator for any site i. This means that we can label eigenstates of the mean field Hamiltonian by the complete set of quantum numbers describing the z projection of the spin on each site. From the discussions in the previous lectures, we can now see that the solutions of the mean field Hamiltonian will therefore be product states. That is because the basis states labelled by the complete set of quantum numbers Sizz will be eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, and these are product states. These are not entangled states. In this precise sense, the eigenstates are like classical states. They're not entangled, they're just product states. In some sense, therefore, this mean field Hamiltonian is giving us classical physics. This is why I said earlier that the mean field Hamiltonian is kind of giving us a semi-classical solution. Notice, however, that exact eigenstates of the full Hamiltonian, rather than this mean field approximation, are not simply product states and are in general entangled. For the mean field Hamiltonian, though, we can write down basis states labelled by this full set of quantum numbers. These are product states and these are eigenstates of the mean field Hamiltonian. With this in mind, we can now solve the Schrodinger equation and then use the machinery of statistical mechanics to find out the thermodynamic observables which will characterize the phase transition. Here is the Schrodinger equation. I apply the mean field Hamiltonian h hat to our basis states labeled by the quantum numbers s1, z, s2, z, s3, z, and so on. And I get that state back again, multiplied by an eigenvalue, which is of course the energy of that state. This is the expression for the energy it follows from the definition of the Hamiltonian itself. Notice here that the energy depends on these quantum numbers, Siz. Notice in particular that these do not have hats on them. These are not operators. They're simply the quantum numbers corresponding to this specific state. Using the Schrodinger equation, which tells us uh, what the energies are of our particular states, we can now calculate the partition function. And of course, I will evaluate this partition function for the mean field Hamiltonian. I'll denote that z subscript mf. This is the sum of all of the Boltzmann weights for all of the eigenstates. Here I'm denoting the sum over all possible spin configurations, c. The Boltzmann weights are e to the minus beta and then the energy of that configuration. Beta here is, of course, inverse temperature, 1 over kBt. I can expand this in the following form. First of all, I have a set of sums here. These enumerate all of the possible 2 to the n spin configurations. For example, this first sum tells us to sum over the values of s1, z. That means plus or minus a half. The second sum tells us to sum over the values of s2, z, also plus or minus a half, and so on, all the way up to the sum over s, n, z. So all of these sums enumerate all of the basis states labelled by the quantum numbers s1, z, s2, z, and so on. And then the thing we're actually summing over are the Boltzmann weights, e to the minus beta, and then the energy. And we can read off from the uh, Schrodinger equation here what the energy is. The energy has two pieces. One piece is just a constant. So I can actually factorize this. This term here is common to all of the configurations. This first term, however, depends on the specific configuration. However, we see that it involves the sum over individual s, j, z terms. I can also expand these out as the product of exponentials. Each factor contains a term like e to the minus b to m, s1z, or s2z, or s3z, and so on, all the way up to snz. And then finally, we have that common factor e to the half b to mn times the expectation value of sz. This might look like a very intimidating expression, but actually it turns out it's rather straightforward. This is because each of these factors only depends on the sz of a particular spin. And of course, we're summing over both of the values of sjz for a given spin j of plus and minus a half. For example, the s1z sum here only affects this term involving s1z. The other sums don't affect this factor. And indeed, the other factors aren't affected by this first sum. 
We can therefore factorize the whole expression in this form by reordering the terms. We have a factor involving the sum of s1z times the factor e to the minus beta m s1z, and so on for s2z, and so on all the way up to snz, and then finally times this common factor. Let's take a look at this first term. s1z can take values of plus and minus a half, and when I substitute that in here, I get two terms, e to the beta m over 2 and e to the minus beta m over 2. What about this second term? Well, as you can immediately see, it gives me exactly the same factor. And in fact, it's the same factor for each of these n terms. The whole mean field partition function can therefore be written in this rather compact way. We have the factor e to the beta m over 2 plus e to the minus beta m over 2, all to the power of n here, where n is the number of spins in our system. And we can actually simplify it further because we'll recognize that e to the beta m over 2 plus e to the minus beta m over 2 is simply twice the hyperbolic cosine of beta m over 2. So this is a very nice calculation. We started off with a very complicated system, and by performing this mean field analysis, we have a very simple closed form expression for the partition function. The partition function is, of course, a centrally important object in statistical mechanics. What can we do with it? Well, in particular, the free energy can be obtained from the partition function. And in turn, the free energy determines the stability of a thermodynamic phase. We'll therefore be able to use this to describe the phase transition in this system. Overall, then, my partition function takes this form. And indeed, you'll notice this second term here also involves a factor of n. So therefore, I can pull out an overall power of n in this expression. So let's now take a look at the free energy of the system. The free energy is, of course, defined as minus kBT log z. The mean field approximation to our free energy, then, can be written as minus 1 over beta log z mean field. Here I'm also using the fact that beta is the inverse temperature, 1 over kBT. The stable thermodynamic phase is then found by minimizing the free energy. Here, we're going to minimize the free energy with respect to the magnetization m, which is our order parameter. I therefore want to find df by dm is equal to zero. I can therefore write that df by dm within our mean field approximation is minus one upon beta of d by dm of log z mf. We know how to differentiate the logarithm of functions, and so I can write the expression in this form. In the end, I just need to calculate d by dm of the partition function zmf. Since I have an explicit closed form expression for the partition function as a function of the magnetization m, we can compute this derivative. When you do the derivative, uh, you get this expression. It looks a little bit messy, but actually there's plenty of things that we can cancel out and tidy up. When we do the simplification, we end up with this expression. I'll leave it as an exercise for you to see, first of all, how I got this expression, and then how I simplified it to this one. It's pretty straightforward algebra, but you just need to go through it yourself. Now, if we want to find the thermodynamic phase by minimizing the free energy, meaning setting this derivative equal to zero, then we can immediately lose this common factor, this constant factor, of minus n over 2, and set the contents of the brackets here to zero. This then gives us a condition for the average magnetic moment m at a given inverse temperature beta in terms of the expectation value of the average Sz. However, m is of course related to the expectation value of Sz. Using the definition of m that we introduced earlier, I can rewrite the expression in the following form. Here, recall that n is the number of nearest neighbors and j is the strength of the nearest neighbor exchange coupling. Also bear in mind that this whole calculation is supposed to be for the ferromagnetic situation where j is itself negative. That means that the right-hand side of this expression will actually be positive. So let me emphasize that by writing the modulus of j. This just means the absolute value of j. That's then a positive number. And then we compensate for that by having a plus sign here outside the front. So at a given inverse temperature beta, we can actually in principle solve this equation to find the magnetization. In fact, such an equation like this is called a transcendental equation. It's not one that has a simple closed form analytic solution. However, uh, we can of course numerically compute the solutions to this and plot it as a function of beta. Alternatively, we could have a look at the small m behavior and do a Taylor series expansion of this tanch here. 
This will give us some analytic insight into what's happening at small m. So let's analyze the mean field stability condition. This is basically a self-consistency condition for the average magnetic moment m in terms of the temperature beta and the bare coupling j. First of all, let's have a look at the small m behavior. In that case, we can approximate the tanch by its Taylor series and truncate the series after the first couple of terms. We have a linear piece and then a cubic piece. Inserting this into our stability condition for m, we obtain the following. And we have a common factor of m in each of the terms here, which we can cancel. Rearranging the equation slightly, we have an expression for m squared on the right hand side here, and this factor beta over 2 minus 1 over nj on the left hand side. Of course, the magnetic moment must be a real quantity, and this means that m squared must be greater than or equal to zero. Since beta is the inverse temperature, and that's always positive, we know therefore that beta over 2 minus 1 over nj is a quantity that must be greater than or equal to zero. Writing this in terms of the temperature, we learn that kbt must be less than or equal to one half nj. We can now identify the critical Curie temperature for the onset of ferromagnetism. The ferromagnetically ordered state with a finite magnetization will occur for a temperature T less than Tc. The phase transition occurs when the magnetization just about vanishes. That happens at T equals Tc, and this is therefore the definition of the Curie temperature. We conclude, therefore, that when T is greater than Tc, we have a disordered phase, also with zero magnetization. We have spontaneous symmetry breaking as we lower the temperature through Tc. We start off with a disordered phase uh, with no net magnetization, meaning the spins are pointing in all different directions. That's a high symmetry situation. But as we pass through the phase transition at Tc and go into the, the low temperature phase, we see spontaneous magnetization and a ferromagnetic state emerges. This is a system with lower symmetry because the system has become polarized. A particular vector for the magnetization has been picked out among all of the equivalent directions. In our calculation here, we assumed that the system had a finite magnetization. We assumed from the onset the ferromagnetic state. That is why, in this calculation, we see that there are no solutions to the equations for temperatures greater than the critical temperature Tc. That's simply because we go through a phase transition to the disordered state, which is not described by our original assumptions. So the fact that the magnetization vanishes, m equals zero, at the critical temperature Tc, actually allows us to find an expression for Tc. We simply saturate the lower bound of this expression and set beta over two minus one over nj equals to zero. We therefore learn that kbtc is equal to one half nj. With this result at hand, let's now have a look at the small m behavior. We can do this by taking our stability condition equation here and simply replacing nj from our expression here by two kbtc. I'll then take out an overall factor of beta and cancel it on this side and do some tidying up to obtain the following. When m is small, the right-hand side is therefore small. This means that the left-hand side is small. T must be close to the critical temperature Tc. By writing beta as 1 over kb Tc, which is equal from this expression to 1 half nj, and then rearranging this equation for m, we find that the magnetization um, in the vicinity of the critical point is root 3 nj, times the square root of 1 over t over tc. This is valid in the small m regime because, of course, here we use the small n approximation for the tanch. So we've learned a number of things here. We've learned that when m is small, um, we're in the vicinity of the phase transition. In particular, when m is equal to 0, we have t equal to tc, the critical temperature, called the Curie temperature. And when m is small, we can work out how the magnetization behaves, and it goes as the square root of 1 minus t over tc. This gives us some analytic insight into what's happening near the phase transition. Of course, we can just take the original transcendental equation and numerically solve it to find m as a full function of temperature.
So how does that look? The full solution to our stability equation gives us a phase diagram that looks like this. Here I'm plotting the average magnetic moment, basically the magnetization, as a function of system temperature. We see that there is a critical temperature, the Curie temperature, where KBTC is one half of NJ. And we also see that at zero temperature, the magnetization saturates to a value of NJ. This simply follows from the fact that um, as temperature goes to zero, beta goes to infinity, and the value of this tanch goes to one. Therefore, this equation can be re rearranged to give m is equal to nj in the zero temperature limit. We also discovered that um, the behavior in the vicinity of the critical point here goes as the square root of one minus t over tc. So we also know something about the shape of this curve. This is rising up as a square root. We see that the magnetization, or the average magnetic moment, I should say here, m, is an order parameter for this phase transition. It is something that is finite in the ordered phase with low symmetry at low temperatures. And we see that it is uh, zero. I can actually extend this line here um, along the temperature axis. The magnetic moment is zero in the high temperature, uh, high symmetry, disordered phase. This is a classic paradigm for a phase transition in which we have spontaneous symmetry breaking and the emergence of an ordered phase at low temperatures. Here it's the polarized ferromagnetic state. So in this lecture we've talked about various things. We talked about broken symmetry and phase transitions. We saw that the ergodic principle can break down across a phase transition and we have to be a little more careful in how we compute um, our thermodynamic observables using the machinery of statistical mechanics. In particular, we saw how a system can get stuck in one of the equivalent low temperature states. This corresponds to spontaneous symmetry breaking and leads to a lower symmetry phase. We then looked at a specific example of the ferromagnetic phases of the Heisenberg model and saw that there is a spontaneous symmetry breaking transition from a disordered state with zero magnetization to a low temperature ferromagnetic polarized state with a finite magnetization. We got an analytic understanding of all of this using mean field theory. This is a simple approximation, but it gives us quite some understanding of this problem. In the next lecture, we're going to consider a special class of models that have exact analytic solutions that we can write down with pen and paper. Although they are not generic, these exactly solvable models will give us a different perspective on the kind of physics arising in spin systems.